<laughs> and thanks for having me. Uh, on behalf of EPCOR and the uh, environment team and quality assurance team, um, really happy to be here. This is a, a really fascinating topic. Um, 30 minutes doesn't do it justice, but um, that's the time we have. I did a slight change on the, on the topic um, in terms of the title. I've entitled it now Managing Climate Change Impacts on Water Resources because um, as much as we're concerned about source water supply, we're also concerned about um, effluent impacts from municipal wastewater plants like Gold Farm or the Capital Region wastewater plants. So it's both source water supply and uh, cumulative effects management. And words are important, so when you look at the title you think managing, well, in order to manage, you first have to understand, right? And so in the presentation, hopefully you'll come away with a sense of the, the um, better understanding that we have about climate change and its impacts on our water balance and our water budget here in the NSR Basin. Also, too, climate change, those two words mean different things to different people. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll see that climate change means both natural change, which is radically um, larger than you might think, and that's what the, the paleohydrology part of this work shows in, in terms of looking at tree rings. It also means uh, the changes that we're introducing ourselves through CO2 levels that are now up to I think they've just gone past 400 ppm. So, um, so just a quick outline. I'm going to give a little bit of context uh, in terms of of uh, who we are, uh, a regional context. Talk a little bit about the NSR basin, then get into the uh, the park study. Park is an acronym for uh, Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative, and also the important outcomes and the next steps that we're we're moving forward on. So at Core Water Services, we have a number of water wastewater plants in Alberta, North, Central, and South Alberta, and also in British Columbia, and also recently uh, some acquisitions in Arizona and New Mexico. And it's interesting when you when you think about this, because climate change, as it's happened in the past and as it's continuing to happen, affects all of those operations, because that climate change is being driven by the Pacific Ocean. So all of these sites would have historically kind of a similar response to, um, to that climate change. In the local context, we have the two water plants, E.L. Smith and Rossdale, and downstream of Rossdale, we have the Gold Bar Wastewater Plant. Actually, if you go further downstream, we also have the uh, Alberta Capital Region Plant. So, in terms of uh, you could say a broad strategy that we have to pour water. Of course, we want to understand what are the, the risks of a changing water balance in the future from climate change. And one of the ways of doing that is also looking into the past. The past is usually an indicator of what's going to happen in the future, especially if you can go far enough into the past and see these various cycles. So that allows us to better manage source water supply, cumulative effects, and also um, uh, look at drought risk and flood risk. And then if you can quantify that, you can then start to do adaptive management strategies. You can then say, well, how much do we have to improve in terms of water conservation? Or in terms of finding alternate supplies if you need to supplement um, a water shortage. So in terms of uh, addressing those sorts of needs, um, a few years ago now, Epcor Water um, engaged the, uh, the park group and co-funded a, um, a study entitled Past, Recent, and Future Hydroclimactic Variability, which is really that paleohydrology work looking at the tree rings. It's really innovative stuff. Uh, it leads to some amazing findings, as you're going to see. And the, uh, the main investigators in that were Dr. Dave Sopchin from the University of Regina, and his collaborators were Dr. James Byrne and Dr. Stefan Kinzel from University of Lethbridge. The NSR watershed itself, just so you have a little bit of context on it, um, most of our source water is coming off of the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains uh, from snowmelt runoff. There is a small contribution, about 3% from glacial melt, 
And because of the nature of that, this basin is, is really quite sensitive to climate change. And that's really what the historical record is going to show, as you'll see. Um, so it's ecologically sensitive. And it's also, thankfully, a, um, a hub of economic activity. And we want to keep that going. This is just a schematic showing the, uh, the basin itself. A couple of key points on here is that in the headwaters, we have the Brazo Dam, and we also have the Bighorn Dam um, with Abraham Lake shown. And I've also highlighted the Klein subwatershed, which is also really important as one of the main, um, essentially, uh, snowmelt rainwater collectors that feeds this drainage basin. And even with the current conditions, we're already starting to see some stresses in the, uh, in the lower reaches and even the middle reaches of the main stem of the NSR. And that's, that's what this is showing here. This is uh, uh, some information from um, Alberta ESRD. And it's essentially showing that in terms of water quality, even with current flow regimes, we do start to see impacts, uh, especially downstream of Metro, uh, Metro Edmonton. So you can imagine that if your water balance is going to change or tighten up as you go into a, a drought condition, there's instant implications in managing uh, water quality and its, and its uh, degradation. Just the nature of the hydrograph here, you can see that flow cubic meters per second on the vertical axis and uh, a typical year across the bottom, January through December. You can see how the flow is, is variable throughout the year with lower winter flows you have your spring runoff, you have your summer storms, and of course this is also modulated with those two dams, which, um, which is actually a really good thing. Um, the next slide. And this is just another bit of background here to give you a sense as to the variability that uh, facilities like Yale Smith and Rosdale, the two water plants, have to address in terms of variations in color and turbidity in the source water of the NSR at those two intakes. And again, with climate change and changing water balance, you can expect to see um, perhaps even more spiky numbers for color and turbidity, depending upon um, the given year. Uh, our source water specialist, uh, Steph Neufeld, is intrinsically involved in source water protection, and uh, she'll be the first one to tell you, she's back right there, that climate change is identified as one of the key risks. Uh, for source water protection because of its impact not only on, on the quantity, but it's really on, on the quality side as well. Now, besides watersheds, another one of my passions is history, especially applied history. So I also like the, uh, the paleohydrology, but it's also interesting to overlay the, the human story with what's going on with, with uh, climate change in the local basin here. So, Really, the key point of this slide is to say that on May 2nd of 1796, which sounds like a long time ago, but it really isn't. Um, in recent times, there was someone on the ground here at uh, uh, Fort Edmonton who noted that uh, they had problems with uh, navigating the NSR because there was a lack of water in the, uh, the main stem of the river. So that's just a little bit of anecdotal information. But, you know, people have been living with that reality now even in recent times. And this is just a nice little schematic here by uh, Mervyn Vavasour, who did a plan view of Fort Edmonton in uh, 1846. And uh, in fact, that's kind of interesting, as uh, Dave Sotchin just mentioned to me the other day, that they've located, they think, some of the timbers at a, uh, at a, at a barn just uh, outside of Edmonton recently here. So that's kind of interesting. But, and also, some of the different names that Fort Edmonton went by, Edmonton House, or Fort de Prairie, or Mishkawak Egan, or Beverly Hills, or Beaver Hills House. Oh, okay. so, Beverly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking they agree. So, uh, the, the findings from this uh, paleohydrology study, um, they, they really challenge, as it should be challenged, this principle of stationarity that's permeated through uh, the 20th century in terms of water resource planning in many countries, including Canada. It's a natural outcome, though, because for 100 years, you've got really precise, highly quantified 
flow gauge data. So it gives you a sense of variability. And then you start to actually believe that that 100 year timeline thereabouts is really giving you the true range of variability that you can, you can see in natural systems. And, and that's just not the case. Um, and studies like, like this study are, are kind of shatter that concept. So in the Park study, uh, one of its main outcomes was to um, augment the, the actual 1912 and 20, 2010 um, NSR gauge records. And you can do that by looking at trees. Uh, there's two types of trees, Douglas fir and limber pine, that are very long-lived. And you can then also look at the, the, the trees that are still alive and the ones that are, that are just dead right beside it, pretty much. Um, and you can look at the tree rings. And uh, uh, the park uh, study team did that very thing. It's, it's very innovative work. And you can collect an inventory of tree ring chronologies, which in this case, for the, uh, the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains, it takes you all the way back to 1063 AD. So this is just a little bit after the Norman invasions, right? This is going way back. And with that approach, you can then actually reconstruct, because you've got 100 years where you've got actual stream gauge data, and you've got the tree rings. And you can look at the width of those tree, tree rings. You can also look at the biomass and the cell structures of those tree rings. You can calibrate it for that 100 years that you have of stream gauge data. And then from that, you've got an inventory that goes back almost another 900 years of these tree rings. And so that's how you can reconstruct a, um, a flow curve. For um, Now in this case, they were only looking at the, um, the width of the tree rings. So at that level of information, you can only construct an, uh, a mean annual flow curve. But you can do more, and that's actually talk about that in the next steps. Um, they also dug, dug into some of the sub-basins, like the Pine sub-basin, and looked at um, um, land cover effects and, and that, but I won't really get into that today. So this is uh, some site photos from one of the seven um, test sites with um, showing the, uh, that's Limber Pine in the, in the central photo there. And the top right image is showing um, a sample of a tree ring, and within that, you know, one tree ring cycle, you have uh, you have an early growth and a late growth phase. Um, for the purposes of this, for, for looking at annual mean flows, it's just looking at the overall width within that tree ring. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I need to show this first because this is the uh, a calibration of those reconstructed flows, the observed. And they reconstruct it. So it's hard to see, but the um, blue line are the actual recorded NSR gauge numbers uh, in terms of mean annual flow in cubic meters per second. The red line is the reconstructed flows during that calibration period going back to 1910 from uh, 2010. And the first thing you'll notice is that it tends to match up pretty close. If you look deeper into it, you'll notice if you look at the, uh, the, the bottom spiky parts, they, they match up pretty good and that kind of makes sense because trees are water sensitive. So if it's a drier year and a drought condition, the trees and the tree rings are going to be able to tell you that information quite accurately. If it's a really wet year, trees are biological systems so they have a limit to how much they can grow and how much uh, 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 biomass they can build up in their tree ring structure, so they're not going to be as sensitive at the high end in terms of uh, higher amounts of precipitation. So that's why you, t you tend to miss the, uh, the really wet conditions. But you're most interested in the dry conditions, the bottom part. But you can see that it actually accounts for the variability quite well, and I think it's around 60% thereabouts. So it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty decent correlation as far as that goes. And now this is a really interesting slide here, because this is the one, there's a lot of content packed into here. But this is now when you go from your calibration period that we said 1910, and you take this approach and you look at your, your tree ring inventory and you can then regress all the way back to that time period of um, 1063 AD. So this is all calculated based on a 
The mean annual flow of the NSR from 1912 to 2010 is around 225 cubic meters a second. So that becomes your, your zero or your midline. And then what you do for each year is you take a look at the annual mean number and you do a delta, plus or minus. So if it was a wetter year, it's above 225 and you get a blue line which spikes up from zero all the way up to plus 125 in terms of cubic meters per second. And conversely, the red is if it's a dry year and you, and you come down from that zero data below. So each spike represents one particular year in terms of a, a plus or minus in terms of the mean annual NSR flow rate. And so you can almost get a headache staring at this long enough, but if you do, uh, you, you will start to see patterns will emerge and, and um, in the park study they did something called spectral analysis and you can see that you go from basically a red clustering and then as you move through the time scale you can hit a blue clustering and there are short term cycles that correlate to the El Nino Southern Oscillation which is on like a three to nine year time cycle flipping back and forth and then there's a lower frequency called a Pacific Decadal Oscillation or PDO which is on a 30 years cool and wet, 30 years dry and hot. Now, in any given year, it can be unique, but there's a trend within those two overlapping cycles. And what's interesting when you look at this, of course, 20th century, we've got increasing, well, I guess I'll go all the way back to about 1860, increasing CO2 emissions. But prior to about 1850, CO2 was pretty stable. And you can see that there were periods in the actual physical um, climate of, uh, of, uh, of Alberta where you had really severe drought conditions. Right? This, is, this is before fossil fuel consumption in any, any significant way. So what I tried to show on the bottom there was uh, those little time blocks. Um, you can see that in, the, in, the, uh, in that period around 1150, there's a chunk of time and then in that period in the uh, the mid 1300s, and then in the late 1400s, and then in the uh, mid uh, 1700s. Those are some of the blocks of time where you, you could have conditions what we can call megatrophs, where you have pretty dry conditions consistently for consecutive years, running for over five years, 10 years, even as much as 20 years, where you have sustained drier conditions. Before even, you know, humankind introduced uh, climate change. And so some of the implications from those reconstructed um, flow curves, besides being a, a decent correlation between it all, is that uh, you, you can see that you've got a larger range, so that concept of stationarity is kind of shattered, that in fact, if you, have a, if you had a thousand years of stream gauge data, you would have a truer sense of the variability that the natural system has. Um, prior to 1900, there were a number of extended periods of, of um, Lower flow conditions. Um, mentioned that there were those two two different modes, um, three to nine year modes, and then in the lower frequency sixty year PDO mode. Now, based on based on this analysis, uh, the study found that about two years ago we entered the wet cool PDO cycle, which is good for us. Um, even with that, though, there, there are still some questions, though, because what drives this PDO cycle is really Pacific Ocean surface temperatures. And, of course, that's, that's sensitive to CO2 in the atmosphere. And there's a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere now than there was for the last thousand years. And so there's a, you know, there's a question that needs to be asked, which is, well, the PDO patterns themselves might themselves change. So you can't you know, bet the farm totally on that. But regardless, though, it means that um, past 2040, um, it's probably good to have some sort of strategies in place to recognize that uh, at that point you would flip into a, a hotter, drier PDO cycle, and you're overlaying that at that time scale with probably CO2 levels are up over 4, 450. So, you should have a plan. Now, that being said, the, the study itself also found that the water balance itself is not going to be appreciably changing. If you looked in terms of just the equivalent millimeters of, say, precipitation depth, 
But the challenge is when that precipitation is coming. So you're going to have, and there's an expectation for having a warmer winter, um, higher maximum air temperatures. Um, because of that, the atmosphere can hold more moisture, so you'll have perhaps a small increase in the precipitation, but it's going to be coming at the wrong time of year, essentially. So you're going to have, in summer, you're going to have um, lower summer flows, and in the winter, you're probably going to have um, higher winter flows. Now, of course, we've got the two dams that modulate that flow as well, but those two dams operate on just a, um, you could say, uh, an interior basis, so they don't, they don't give you any coverage if you had successive years of, uh, of drier conditions. Just uh, two more content slides left, and then we can get to any interesting questions here. So some of the outcomes from this was that uh, climate change, natural climate change itself, does pose a, uh, a long-term um, major risk in terms of lower summer flows. And with that, you can expect uh, some degradation in water quality. Um, so that would have implications even for the, uh, the work that we just heard about for the industrial heartland. Um, most challenging scenario is if, uh, is if we entered one of those mega drought phases. Um, what that would mean in terms of, uh, you know, I think we'd be able to cope, but that's why we need to have some next steps to make sure that we can actually firmly say that yes, we can, and this is how we're going to do it. Uh, as I mentioned, the two dams, they do mitigate some of the drought impacts, but they're not providing you with multi-year storage. Um, and also, too, the fact that uh, the PDO pattern itself, it might change as the Pacific Ocean itself is showing signs of, uh, of, of increased um, surface temperatures. So this is the, uh, this is the important slide. Uh, some of the next steps that uh, are underway at Upcore Water is uh, just recently uh, had some discussions with, um, with Danny Sachin, University of Lethbridge, about what can we do next that makes the most sense, is the most rational, in terms of coming up with um, adaptation strategies or mitigative plans um, for the next, well, going up to say the year, something like 2070, so two PDO cycles into the future. Beyond that, it's, it's too unpredictable, realistically. And so, right now, we've kind of landed on two general approaches. Um, and approach number one, and we probably do both, um, we've got a proposal coming in the next uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. But the first approach is to, is to look a little bit deeper into those reconstructed flows going all the way back to 1063 AD, because they're based on a mean annual number. So you could say, like, say for the year 1940, it was 200 cubic meters per second mean annual flow. But you really want to break that down a little bit smaller and, and, and uh, get the time scale down to, say, a, a monthly average, or at least a seasonal, but if you can do it for a monthly average, then you can actually look at your um, your water balance needs. Um, if you want to be using contemporary uses, or if you want to have even a, in a, in a conservation mode, what your water balance needs for consumptive use are going to be, and also for the receiving effluent from the two wastewater plants, and see where you stand uh, on a monthly basis. It's essentially like saying that if you took metro, the metro Edmonton region and transplanted it back in time to 1063 AD and just ran the clock forward. And you could then actually see what your deficits would be on a monthly basis for the last 12,000 months. That'd be one, one interesting approach, and apparently um, that hasn't been done in Canada yet, but apparently it's been done in the state of Arizona. So that's, that's a precedent for it. Um, and also with that, some people might say, well, that's just crazy, right? Like, no one builds a city that lasts a thousand years. Unless you're Roman or Etruscan or something. But, um, and then the other thing about it, too, is that recognizing that, uh, recognizing that uh, during that time scale, um, your CO2 levels were, were mostly at around 275 ppm. So that's not really representative of the future going forward, okay? But it is an indicator of, of what happened in the past recognizing 
again. So the second approach then is to uh, is to select one of the global climate change models that best mimics surface temperatures in the Pacific and use that model. And um, you can then actually apply that um, with the understanding of how it affects how the PDO cycles affect uh, this region. And you can then construct, for sure, you can construct annual mean averages. And you can then do simulations and you can get an envelope of um, the real projected variability that you could expect in terms of mean annual flows going up to the year 2070. And then you can look at the, you can essentially construct probabilistic curves then to then say, what is the likely low end of our water supply in not you know past 2040 for that 30 year period, um, and that model then also then accounts for elevated CO2 levels, which the first approach doesn't do. Uh, and then once you kind of have that, you can then kind of start to kick the tires on the water balance and the, and the deficit needs, and you can then look at um, what's doable, what's achievable in terms of conservation measures, or in terms of finding supplemental water supplies. If, if you did hit a mega drought phase, you might want to have some some science ready to go so that you know that you could, for example, um, use groundwater supplies or, or the Beverly Aquifer Channel or, um, or be more aggressive on rainwater harvesting in, in urban areas um, like some communities already do. Um, but yeah, it's really about using the science to be practical and build uh, strategies for urban and uh, regional resilience.